Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello and welcome friends to this third and concluding lecture on B. R. Ambedkar. In this lecture, we are going to discuss his views on liberal democracy and constitutional morality. In previous two lectures, we have basically discussed his views on caste and untouchability and how to annihilate uh, caste or remove untouchability uh, from the society and how uh, in ideal society which is based on the principle of liberty, equality and fraternity is um, impossible to uh, construct without annihilating the caste or the caste system and what uh, are the methods or how that uh, uh, exploitative uh, system of caste have justification even in the contemporary times and how uh, effectively that can be annihilated that we have discussed through his uh, writings primarily uh, his text uh, annihilation of caste. Today uh, we are going to discuss his views on liberal democracy and constitutional morality. So remember there are different uh, strands of thought in Ambedkar and basically uh, some scholars have argued and in um, uh, reception or in um, um, identifying Ambedkar merely as a caste thinker or a leader who was trying to eradicate untouchability do not uh, do justice to the role of Ambedkar as a national leader, as a democratic thinker or uh, someone who was uh, deeply uh, or intellectually involved in the making of a country or a society which should be uh, based on the principles of um, uh, liberty, equality and fraternity and the interrelationship between these three principles are necessary not just in political life or in the legal sphere, but also in the social and economic sphere. So, for him democracy is all encompassing way of life, a, mo a mode of associated living where the uh, mutual respect or uh, respect of others, the uh, compassion or the fellow feeling is the basis for the formation of uh, such society which is for him an ideal society. So, um, uh, Ambedkar um, was uh, deeply involved or um, uh, conscious of the challenges or uh, the obstructions and impediments in the realization of uh, such society uh, and uh, uh, he shared with many uh, scholars about uh, the skeptical skepticism about the possibility of, uh, of India as a nation or Indian nationalism which is inherently uh, divided into different groups, different sections and it treats each other with contempt or uh, there is a graded hierarchy. So, in such condition how a uh, state or how a government or a democratic government can sustain itself and that is the challenge which Ambedkar was trying to um, grapple with, trying to um, uh, understand and also provide solution to and he considered uh, liberal democracy and by liberal democracy uh, and the method that he has used is always non-violent or uh, a kind of um, uh, satyagraha in his own way to fight for the uh, legitimate rights of uh, the untouchables or the Dalits and also to resolve the social issues or the uh, challenges through the peaceful method, through the constitutional method when it is available. When it is not available, then one can understand the politics such uh, uh, such as 
extra constitutional politics of say non cooperation or other modes of agitations, but when the constitutional methods are available, then a society uh, must um, uh, proceed by following that method, that process of um, uh, constitutional method to resolve its uh, issues, to address it, uh, it concerns. So, Ambedkar was um, um, uh, uh, trying to um, understand uh, the uh, feasibility or the um, uh, appropriateness of such constitutional method in a society which is deeply divided on caste lines, on religious lines and there is a graded hierarchy uh, uh, which prevent it to, uh, to, uh, to develop a kind of fellow feeling or mutual respect to uh, 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 different sections or different uh, groups. So, for um, Ambedkar in uh, that sense democracy needs to be supplemented or political democracy needs to be supplemented with the social democracy and social democracy in that sense remains the base for the liberal uh, political democracy to uh, sustain or to uh, continue. He writes on um, uh, liberal democracy that a democratic form of government presupposes a democratic form of a society, now which is missing in India and that is the challenge how to overcome this discrepancies in the political democracy and absence of social democracy. So, a democratic form of government presupposes a democratic form of society. The formal framework of democracy is of no value and would indeed be a misfit if there was no social democracy. So, understanding of Ambedkar is very comprehensive as to what is the role of democracy and he tries to strengthen or tries to caution the uh, policy makers in the constituent assembly and one of the quote we will discuss later where he clearly express or assert this life of contradiction for the democracy in post independent India and how to eradicate such contradictions. So, for Ambedkar then the liberal democracy or the political democracy is not something which is complete in itself if there is absence of social democracy. So, social democracy or the social economic democracy is the base on which political democracy uh, can flourish. So, uh, this is absolutely necessary in his conception of democracy. He was one of the passionate supporter of the liberal democracy which treats individual on the basis of his or her worth and not on the basis of his or her inheritance or his station of life in the hierarchy, but on the basis of the merit or the worth of individual and the free discussion or deliberation as the basis or as the method of social progress or uh, social economic change. And that uh, uh, Ambedkar wholeheartedly uh, 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 accepted and also therefore, he criticized many ideologies certainly communist, so, uh, socialist and also uh, uh, the um, conservative Hinduism or separatist uh, uh, Muslims. His belief in liberal democracy and uh, deliberative process of resolving conflict, resolving concerns allowed him to criticize uh, the uh, communist, socialist and also the cultural chauvinistic organizations such as Hindu Mahasabha or uh, Muslim League or um, many such organizations which believed in some kind of revivalistic uh, politics or extra constitutional means to uh, create a nation or to create an ideal society. For Ambedkar the ideal society or the modern religion should be based on this tripartite relationship between the, princ uh, between the principles of liberty, equality and fraternity and that becomes the very basis for his idealization of society as well as the state or uh, the uh, form of government. So, um, uh, Ambedkar have a very comprehensive or a kind of uh, very passionate support for liberal democracy or deliberative modes uh, of uh, resolving conflict or asserting rights um, uh, uh, even by those who are disposed. So, he reject any violent uh, modes of agitation and politics in support of uh, liberal uh, constitutional 
or parliamentary mode of uh, politics. So, his support for liberal democracy is both in its form and practice was the ideal form of government for him. And he had a very comprehensive understanding of liberal democracies, its practices and also its limitations. So, he believed in the representative form of government, but democracy for him was more than mere representation. In his own words, democracy is not merely a form of government, it is primarily a mode of associated living, of conjoined communicated experience. It is essentially an attitude of respect and reverence towards fellow men. So, that is a kind of all encompassing definition and understanding of democracy in Ambedkar, which is much more than a form of government or merely a form of government, which ensure representation. For Ambedkar, democracy is something which enables a kind of associated life, which uh, help in uh, creating a culture of mutual respect and reverence among the fellow uh, men and um, men and women. Why uh, I have said that he, uh, when he is um, uh, aware of the uh, uh, value or the um, application of uh, liberal principles or liberal democracy when a society like India, which is divided on caste lines, linguistic lines or religious lines. Uh, he is also equally aware of its limitation, where there is a lack of focus on the equal, uh, equality. And this point we will discuss later certainly in the um, uh, context where he is arguing about uh, uh, this absence of social and economic democracy will lead to the peril of liberal democracy or the window dressing merely. So, his conception of democracy is related to his idea of a good society that treats everyone with equality and with dignity and without contempt. So, he defined good society as the one which is based on the principle of liberty, equality and fraternity. So, this becomes the very basis of his politics and political philosophy or his idea of uh, uh, ide a good society or a good uh, uh, country. So, democracy in such ideal society constituted or based on the principle of liberty, equality and fraternity is both a means as well as an end to form such society. It is a means as the way through which a good society can be built. So, democracy is a basis or is a way forward to create such society, to construct such society and it is also an end as all society aspire for such ideal or such a, a democracy to be the modes of their governance or their uh, their governing. So, democracy in uh, such context is both a means in the social uh, economic sphere and also an end to uh, uh, achieve that uh, democracy in the political deliberative, uh, deliberative sphere as well. So, one important feature of Ambedkar's vision of democracy is that it is the medium of social transformations and human progress, especially in a country like India. So, democracy then there is not uh, merely a kind of uh, modes of government or the form of government, but also a tool for social and economic transformation or to ensure human progress or human empowerment. So, he regarded democracy as a form and a method of government method of government whereby revolutionary changes in the economic and social life of the people are brought without bloodshed or without violent agitations or resorting to violent politics. So, Ambedkar believes in the liberal democracy or democratic form of government is not just because it helps in, in governing a country or a society in a particular way, but it can also be the uh, tool or means to social and economic transformation, uh, which, uh, which is revolutionary uh, accomplishment without resorting to the violent or the um, uh, bloodshed or the violent politics of any kind or the revolutionary politics. So, Ambedkar believes in the democracy and democratic modes of government 
is not just to ensure a particular form of government or the political rule, but a means, a method to also achieve social and economic revolutionary transformation without resorting to violence or uh, bloodshed. So, this leads to the another feature of democracy in Ambedkar that is the relation of political democracy with social and economic democracy that we have also discussed in the beginning the quotation where the social democracy in Ambedkar's conception is the base on which political democracy can flourish. So, political democracy or the rule of the people is the route to all progress. For him, the soul of democracy consists in the fulfillment of political principles of one man, one vote and one vote, one value. So, that is the basis of democracy where everyone is treated equally, uh, have equal vote and their vote has equal value. So, there is no differences uh, in terms of their economic status or social status or religious status. So, political uh, uh, democracy treats every citizen equally, uh, they are entitled to same rights or equal rights without any discrimination on the basis of caste, creed, language, sex, etcetera. But political democracy is nothing if there is no social and economic democracy. In other words, social and economic democracy are the tissues and fibers of political democracy. So, without the such uh, social and economic democracy, there is no strength, no effectiveness or no this very survival of uh, political democracy is in danger. So, the strength of political democracy thus depends on the strength of social and economic democracy which is deeply interlinked. So, democracy is intricately related to the question of equality. So, so important this conception of equality is is in Ambedkar's conception of democracy that he considered the lack of attention to the different aspects of equality as one of the major reasons for failures of parliamentary democracy in western country. So, basically the limitation of liberal democracy in western countries that Ambedkar saw or observed he believed was uh, because of their lack of attention to the different aspects of social equality which is necessary, which is, uh, uh, which is uh, uh, required for a uh, political democracy to be truly effective. So, uh, the idea of equality not in the uh, political or legal uh, sense only, but also in the social and economic sphere is equally necessary. So, in that kind of conception, the democracy then is not merely a form of government, but also encompasses all sphere of human life including social and economic and that leads to a fraternity, a sense of fellow feeling which will strengthen the nation and leads to empowerment or also the progress of the nation. So, he wrote parliamentary democracy developed a passion for liberty. It never made a nodding acquaintance with equality. It failed to realize the significance of equality and did not even endeavor to strike a balance between liberty and equality, with the result that liberty swallowed equality and has made democracy a name and a force. So, in many western uh, parliamentary mode of liberal democracy, Ambedkar identify their limitation in a sense where they emphasize or perhaps over emphasize on this question of liberty or individual freedom, they do not uh, understand or they do not recognize the equal significance of equality or perhaps a proper balance between liberty on the one hand and equality on the other hand to have a society which would be more compass, compassionate society, which will lead to a, a more uh, powerful democracy in a political sphere and ultimately to the strength and progress of a nation. So, uh, this he realized even in the western conception. So, when he was articulating the uh, democracy and democratic modes of governance in a post colonial society or a um, society like India divided on caste, religion, sex and creed and um, uh, sex, he was uh, arguing for a kind of balance 
between equality, liberty and fraternity. So, all the three principles are necessary or intertwined in his conception of democracy in uh, India. So, for him or in his conception of democracy, democracy is also linked to the practice of uh, rationality or rational thinking or scientific outlook. These are the basis of public debate and discussion and leads to a participatory democratic discourse. So, his approach to the social challenges or the economic challenges or different um, issues related to the public and political life of uh, uh, a society needs to be discussed and deliberated upon through rationally or with a scientific outlook, not with some, uh, some kind of prejudiced or uh, irrational approach or uh, superstitious approach to uh, these concerns, but it needs to be uh, debated uh, rationally or with a scientific outlook to arrive at a possible pragmatic solution to uh, such challenges. Another distinguished feature of his conception of democracy is the ethical dimension and this ethical dimension leads to the question of constitutional morality. So, that we will discuss after we discuss his views on practices of democracy in India or practice of democracy in India and the challenges of a democratic polity or democratic culture in India. So, the process of public debate or uh, deliberation on any issue uh, through rational or scientific outlook uh, require a form of ethical uh, um, uh, approach or a kind of uh, morality which he uh, calls or uh, express as a constitutional morality. So, in his conception of uh, democracy there is uh, uh, rational scientific as well as the ethical dimension of understanding democracy not merely to solve a uh, problem or to achieve a desired objective. Of course, the whole structure is to achieve uh, such, uh, such ends or such objectives, but more than that there is a agreement to a process to uh, a mode through which one is uh, uh, committed to arrive at solution to achieve certain objectives. So, more than achieving the objects then the concern for adopting the method to achieve that objective is equally important and that uh, he uh, discusses as a constitutional morality which is not innate, which need to be inculcated. So, we will discuss it in this. So, in his conception then briefly to sum up, uh, the political democracy needs to be supplemented or, uh, uh, or comp uh, supp supplemented with the social and economic democracy and uh, the approach uh, to uh, uh, political debate and discussion should be rational and scientific with a ethical dimension and only uh, when there is a kind of balance between liberty and equality on the one hand and fraternity on the other only then an ideal society can be uh, achieved and democracy is a means and also an end to achieve that ideal society. Now, to uh, talk about practice of democracy in India for him democracy was not a new thing in India, it had experienced republics and it also experienced monarchies of limited and electoral nature. He also gave the example of Buddhist Sanghas, he stated that these were the representatives of modern forms of parliamentary or participatory form of governance, but unfortunately India had lost its democratic system or democratic spirit. One of the main reason for this was according to Ambedkar the graded hierarchy of Indian society which is caste system. So, caste with its graded inequality and moral degeneration has killed the democratic spirit in India and how it degenerate the moral and ethical or the uh, democratic spirit of uh, Indians and how their morality and ethics is also bonded to their caste or to their uh, sect is something we have discussed in previous lecture which we can, uh, you can refer to. So, uh, in Ambedkar's uh, conception democracy and democratic modes of governing the self and community is not something new to India, it, it already existed certainly the Buddhist Sangha or Gan Sangha is the example of such republican form of uh, government or participatory nature of uh, governing, but 
gradually India lost it because of this uh, uh, graded inequality in the form of caste system which lead which kills public spirit which obstruct a uh, common outlook because the moral and ethical concern of the individual is uh, uh, bonded or limited to their caste and uh, and sex. So, um, with the liberal democratic constitution, democracy is again sought to establish in India. However, Ambedkar was worried about losing democracy in India for the second time too, because there is a kind of contradiction in Indian life where in politics or in legal sense everyone is equal, but in social and economic sense the inequality is widely uh, prevailing. So, how to maintain uh, democracy or protect the democratic constitutional spirit in India. So, Ambedkar offered three distinct ways through which democracy can be safeguarded in India. First, he laid a stress upon upholding constitutional method of politics. He held that the constitution provides enough means to address people's concerns and aspirations. He did not therefore, support the adoption of unconstitutional or extra constitutional method such as violent protest or demonstrations. He also referred to the use of non-cooperation, civil disobedience or satyagraha as extra constitutional methods and he regarded them as the grammar of anarchy. In one of his speech in the constituent assembly while presenting the draft of the constitution, he considered these methods of politics as extra constitutional, uncalled for, unrequired for when there is a constitutional method available to resolve people's concerns and to uh, reconcile the differences. So, uh, he uh, considered these modes of um, um, uh, protest or politics as uh, grammar of anarchy and stated that sooner they are abandoned, the better it will be for the future of constitution and democracy in India. So, the emphasis, so the democracy in India can survive only when different groups or parties follow the constitutional method of politics and abstain or restrain from following unconstitutional or extra constitutional modes of politics. Secondly, he cautioned against the hero worshipping. This is the biggest challenge for any democracy or for any democratic society where one man or a group of men are considered or empowered enough to uh, geopardize the whole uh, structure of democratic governance and also uh, uh, that may lead to a kind of um, um, authoritarianism or uh, uh, a kind of uh, um, undemocratic uh, uh, rule where the citizens are treated merely as the subject or as the uh, uh, tool. Whereas, uh, democracy uh, or democratic ways of uh, governing or resolving conflict is to empower the individual and empowerment of individual will lead to the empowerment of society and the empowerment of society will ultimately lead to the politic, uh, strength, uh, ultimately strengthen the political democracy uh, and in the progress of uh, uh, nation. So, the second challenge or the second caution that Ambedkar had was against the hero worshipping. He considered it as a threat to the future as well as the survival of democracy in India. He stated um, in India, Bhakti or what may be called the path of devotion or hero worship plays a part in its politics unequalled in magnitude by the part it plays in the politics of any other country in the world. Now, he is making a statement or profound statement about the working of democratic politics uh, in a society like India, where um, uh, the idea is that all men uh, shares the same rights or has the same right, yet in the actual practice of politics there is so much of hero worshipping or bhakti to a particular re, uh, leader, to a particular uh, uh, party that uh, 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 it uh, can lead to or it can very well lead to a kind of authoritarian um, uh, uh, authoritarian uh, rule or jeopardize the whole uh, structure of uh, democratic form of gov uh, governance and it, uh, it certainly obstruct the formation of 
a culture or a political culture which is essentially democratic. So, the focus should be on the institution or a method or a process rather than the individual or the group of individual or a party which is involved. So, he is cautioning against this kind of hero worshipping in the politics which is unequalled in magnitude in India then it is anywhere in the world. So, in the politics the hero worship and that we see even in our contemporary times. So, loyalty to the individual rather than to the institution or to a process of governance is a challenge for our democratic structure or democratic modes of governance where the individual or some individual or group of individual enjoy enormous power and which presents a serious threat or challenge to the democracy and its institution and also put a threat to the individual liberty that is enshrined in such constitution. He was cautioning against such form of uh, hero worship which is so much pervasive in Indian politics. He further writes that bhakti in religion may be a road to salvation of the soul, but in politics bhakti or hero worship is a sure road to degradation and eventual dictatorship. So, this is the second caution he is giving for maintaining a democratic form of government or a liberal democracy in India. For doing that, it is necessary to restrain from any kind of hero worshipping. So, no matter how wise a person is, one should not trust or be loyal to that person, but to the process of democracy which we have collectively adopted or agreed upon. So, that remains the very prophetic caution that Ambedkar has given on the very uh, foundation of um, uh, uh, or the, uh, during the uh, formation of constitution itself, but we continue to see uh, such kind of undemocratic or um, uh, undemocratic culture in India where the loyalty to the person or a group or a party consider uh, or rewarded more than loyalty to the constitution and its, uh, its institution, which is uh, for Ambedkar surer road to degradation or may eventually lead to dictatorship or authoritarian form of government. Thirdly, he warned Indians not to content only with political democracy, but to equally strive for social democracy. This is connected to his whole conception of democracy as such. So, political democracy cannot survive without the presence of social democracy and he defines social democracy in the following uh, words, which uh, for him means a way of life which recognizes liberty, equality and fraternity as the principles of life. So, for him any ideal society or ideal uh, democracy must uh, uh, include this principle of equality, liberty and fraternity without the one other cannot survive. So, this philosophy of liberty, equality and fraternity in his thought constitute a tripartite relationship and without the one other cannot exist. So, there cannot be in Ambedkar's conception a trade off between liberty and equality. So, without liberty equality has no meaning and without equality liberty it is in itself is not sufficient or it cannot guarantee the success of a collective form of government such as a democracy without such form of liberty is available or accessible to everyone. And the two uh, liberty and equality has no meaning unless it leads to a culture of fraternity where uh, the compassion or the respect or uh, recognition of dignity of everyone is also ensued. So, in this um, conception of social democracy or political democracy of Ambedkar, the principle of liberty, equality and fraternity and all of them uh, together constitute his ideals of social and political democracy, where there cannot be a trade off between liberty and equality or liberty and equality and fraternity. All must go together and there should be a kind of balance between these three principles in his conception. So, Ambedkar very succinctly expressed the inherent contradictions of democracy in India in the following words and this he stated 
when he was presenting the drafting constitu uh, uh, draft constitution. He said, we are going to enter into a life of contradictions. In politics, we will have equality and in social and economic life, we will have inequality. In politics, we will be recognizing the principle of one man, one vote and one vote, one value. In our social and economic life, we shall by reason of our social and economic structure continue to deny the principle of one man, one value. How long shall we continue this life of contradictions? So, this is the greatest challenge for Indian democracy according to Ambedkar where in the political life, uh, there is um, acknowledgement or recognition of uh, equality that is to say one man, one vote, one vote, one value. But in social and economic life, because of our inherent social and economic structure, we will continue to deny such uh, principle of one man, one value. Ambedkar uh, is cautioning the constitution maker or the policy maker that how long Indian democracy can survive if we continue to live in this, uh, in this um, life of contradictions. So, sooner this contradiction is removed, the better it will be. Now, this is a matter of debate how far we have been successful in ensuring or strengthening social democracy in India. So, politically uh, or um, in terms of elections or in terms of representation, we may say we have achieved a level of democracy. There is some maturity, but then there are many challenges to uh, such democracy and this fundamental contradictions of uh, political democracy on the one hand and absence of social and econo economic democracy on the other is something which we have to uh, still um, um, ponder upon or think about. So, for Ambedkar, in order to preserve or maintain and also strengthen democracy in India, one need to guard it against three things basically. First, the extra constitutional means of politics such as non-cooperation, satyagraha or violent uh, modes of politics. So, the constitution or the politics must be guarded against extra constitutional methods of politics or means of politics. Second, hero worship or devotion to a particular leader. The third, political democracy combined with social and economic democracy based on the principle of liberty, equality and fraternity. To do sum up, so for the maintenance or preservation of or safeguarding Indian democracy, one need to guard it against these three challenges or three threats to uh, democracy in India. Now, to discuss his views on constitutional morality, he offered an eloquent observation on the principle of constitutional morality in constituent assembly. This was something very rarely discussed and the account of Ambedkar remained very crucial on this subject. So, how a society which is graded in inequality or hierarchical society divided on caste, religious, or sectarian lines will continue to follow a process which is uh, which is enshrined in the constitution or how to make uh, the functioning of uh, democracy or democratic institution effective in a society which believes in different unconstitutional or even illegal practices such as untouchability and so on. So, in such society, how, uh, how a uh, trust or a belief in the constitutional method or uh, uh, um, a, a parliamentary uh, method can be made effective. So, there uh, comes the ethical or the moral dimension of ensuring the success or effectiveness of a uh, democracy, which he explains through this concept of constitutional moral morality, which is not widely discussed um, 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 uh, by then. So, he, his account uh, in this context remains very crucial. So, in his speech on the draft constitution on 4th November 1948, Ambedkar first introduced the constitution to the assembly and then went on to invoke and discuss in details this concept of constitutional morality. Now, while emphasizing the value of constitutional morality, he quoted George Grodd and stated that the diffusion of constitutional morality not merely among the majority of any community, but throughout the whole is the indispensable condition of a government 
at once free and peaceable. Since even any powerful and obstinate minority may render the working of a free institution impracticable without being strong enough to conquer ascendance for themselves. So, this principle of constitutional morality is not something which should be uh, imbibed by the majority community, but even those in the minority or those who cannot on their own ascend to the power or acquire power can also render this uh, constitution or constitutional uh, mechanism impracticable or ineffective if um, the uh, principle or the process which is enshrined in the constitution is followed by them or as well. So, the diffusion or this culture of trust or belief in the constitutional process of um, attaining certain objectives or resolving uh, some differences is something which should be inculcated not just by the majority community, but also by those who are in the minorities and that is absolutely necessary for uh, a uh, effective or for the strengthen, strengthening of democracy and democratic rule in any society or the constitutional uh, mechanism. So, uh, uh, this imbibing of constitutional morality by every section both majority and minority is something absolutely indispensable for the working of constitution or for making it effective form of governance. In defining constitutional morality, Ambedkar referred to Groot's definition again, where Groot's write a paramount reverence for the forms of constitution enforcing obedience to authority acting under and within these forms, yet combined with the habit of open speech of action subject only to definite legal control and unrestrained censure of those very authorities as to all their public acts combined to with a perfect confidence in the bosom of every citizen amidst the bitterness of party contest and that the form of constitution will not be less sacred in the eyes of his opponents than his own. So, this is basically about the faith or trust in a form or in a process which ensures uh, free speech or which ensures uh, uh, that, um, that they may differ in their opinion or in their approach to certain subject or that can be subjected to some forms of legal control, but despite of their differences or bitterness or uh, opponents to each other, opposition to each other the both party must um, must consider or recognize the sacredness of the constitution or constitutional mechanism as it is there in the opponent. So, this belief in the form or um, in the process of resolving conflict or attaining objective which is the constitutional mechanism is something which is absolutely necessary for the constitutional morality to emerge. So, the um, emphasis here is again both by those who enjoy authority or those who are in the opponents to the sacredness of the institution or the process. So, here again one can connect it to the question of hero worshipping or individual. So, in the democratic functioning or the role of constitution and constitutional mechanism is to ensure the sanctity or the uh, sacredness of the mechanism or the process. Uh, in the eyes of both those who are in the power, those who are in the authority or those who are questioning that authority or opposing that authority for both of them the sacredness or the sanctity of the constitution and process should be equally um, uh, uh, respected or um, uh, recognized. So, to look at Ambedkar's views on constitutional morality, which can be interpreted in multiple ways, there are two popular uses of the term. Firstly, it means being governed by the substantive morality of the constitution, that is to abide by the constitutional mechanism of conducting politics or resolving the difference or acquiring the power to attain certain uh, uh, objectives or agenda of different uh, groups and there are the constitutional mechanism available for 
attainment of such objectives and agenda. So, the first uses of this term constitutional morality entails abiding by the constitutional mechanism or substantive morality that is enshrined in the constitution. The second refers to being governed by the convention and protocols, then this is the question of proprietorship or a kind of discretion which follow the convention and protocols in grey areas of decision making process. So, where constitution is silent or ambiguous in such moments or uh, in, on such occasions there has to be a guide uh, uh, by following certain convention and protocol which strengthen or which empower the constitutional morality where it is not explicitly clear. Ambedkar was more concerned about the second usage of the term. So, in similar line with the Grown, Ambedkar also held that constitutional morality is not commonly observed. So, it is not automatic, it is not naturally available in any society or any community. It has to be constantly or continuously nurtured. So, it is not natural, but something that needs to be cultivated. People of India are yet to learn and develop constitutional morality. So, especially where a democracy in India is only a top dressing on an Indian soil, which is essentially undemocratic, uh, divided on so many caste lines or religious uh, lines. So, this culture of constitutional morality is something which needs to be cultivated. It is not naturally available, it is not um, uh, automatically available to any society or, uh, or community. But, however, for the effective functioning of the constitution, the constitutional morality is absolutely necessary for a society. So, for Grot, constitutional morality primarily refer to freedom and self restraint. Freedom is to express or articulate one's position or approach to politics in a particular way and they may differ from the other groups or other organization, but also the self restraint that is to abide by a commonly agreed process or the mechanism which is there in the constitution. So, freedom is guaranteed by the practice of self restraint. So, it is not mutually exclusive. So, therefore, the presence of constitutional morality in this sense totally wipes out the presence of revolutionary politics or revolutionary methods of politics. Ambedkar follows Grode when he rules out the practices or politics of unconstitutional methods. So, Ambedkar criticizes the use of a vast range of political actions including Satyagraha or non-cooperation or many modes of Gandhian politics in the independent India. However, those methods were very popular during the anti-colonial struggle or the freedom struggle. These are criticized for being incompatible with the observance of the constitutional morality. So, for Ambedkar, such modes of extra constitutional politics is a grammar of anarchy and it uh, weakens the constitution and constitutional morality in the country and therefore, he wanted or he cautioned the polit uh, political leaders and parties to uh, abdicate or refrain from using such uh, extra constitutional modes of politics. This indicates his emphasis on self restraint as a component of constitutional morality. So, constitutional morality is not just about the freedom or the autonomy to uh, conduct one politics or to develop certain articulation of political or social issues, but also to abide by, restrained by the mechanism or the process which is um, already uh, available or enshrined in the constitution. Another important element of constitutional morality is the recognition of plurality and management and adjudication of differences remains crucial in this understanding of constitutional morality, where there is no one point of view or homogeneity about or homogeneous approach to politics, to society or to certain policy issue. Those differences are recognized, acknowledged and respected. However, how to res uh, resolve such differences or reconcile such differences is something which can be done or arbitrated through the constitutional morality. So, the non-violent resolution of problems of differences demand the existence of a congruent constitutional process, which can and should arbitrate these differences. These processes 
may be entailed in the practices of parliament and courts and therefore, constitutional morality demands the obedience of these institutions or a mechanism or a process through which differences or the conflict or uh, contradictions in society or uh, in opinions can be arbitrated or reconciled. So, um, uh, the freedom, the um, autonomy to articulate uh, one's opinion and differ from each other is perfectly okay if or accepted, acknowledged if they abide by a particular mechanism or process which should be abiding for everyone uh, or uh, different parties or groups having difference of opinion. So, what it uh, actually says that people may not be content with the substance or outcomes of these processes, what constitutional morality demands is that their allegiance to the form or the processes of adjudication and not necessary to the outcomes. The constitutional morality focuses on, therefore, on the mechanism or the forms or the processes of uh, achieving certain objectives or at, uh, attainment of certain objectives or formulating or implementing certain policies. So, people are entitled to not to be content with the outcomes of a policy, but they must abide by the constitutional process and that is the demand of the constitutional moralities, not about what is the outcome or what is the result of uh, this process on which people or groups may differ, but they must uh, abide or show allegiance to the forms and the process of adjud adjudication. So, a constitutional morality is a skeptical of any personification of authority therefore, the process, the forms matters more than the individual or the personality. So, this is related to the claim of popular sovereignty. It does not matter how popular one's authority is, constitutional morality forever questions its claim to singularly representing the will of the people. Thus, the question of representation is one critical element that constitutional morality deal with. So, no group, no individual can claim in itself that it singularly represent the popular will or the will of the people that may, can be contested within the uh, uh, restraints of the constitutional mecha mechanism or constitutional uh, morality. So, constitutional morality deals with the question of popular sovereignty as well where uh, there may be uh, some groups or uh, individual claiming that they and they alone represent the will of the people, but within the prim, uh, structure or the premise of constitutional morality, there are the uh, space for contestation of such claims, but those who are claiming or those who are contesting both must abide themselves within the mechanism which is the constitutional mechanism and that is the demand of constitutional morality. Uh, so, constitutional morality is more realized by the observance of the processes of doing certain things and not really by the things themselves or the objectives of doing those. So, the emphasis is on the form or the processes of working and not the outcome or the consequences of such working on which uh, people or group may differ. So, constitutional morality allows the growth of a constitutional culture which is abstract and based on cooperations and which needs to be inculcated or strengthened. This is the process which helps individuals to surpass their immediate identity and adhere to a shared process of adjudications despite all the differences they all become part of a common culture. To form a common culture or a unified um, um, uh, culture or sense of self, there is a need to surpass or transcend one's immediate identity, be it caste, religion and so on and so forth. So, he recognized caste in this context put an inherent threat to constitutional morality because it prevents surpassing or transcending these immediate identities of birth or the descriptive identity of caste. So, working as a tool of divide caste does not allow the formation of a common deliberative culture that is based on equality. It is therefore, biggest impediments or what he calls anti-national in India in the formation and development of constitutional 
morality. So, caste uh, or caste system is the greatest impediments because it reduce the individual worth to his or her caste status and does not really help in creating a equal society or egalitarian society. So, uh, that is the biggest challenge uh, for uh, uh, the emergence of constitutional morality in a country like uh, India. So, um, um, to conclude his uh, um, uh, thought or to his arguments on liberal democracy or constitutional morality and also what we have discussed his views on caste, we can take it from the linear Juliet assessment of Ambedkar as the performer of three roles, one as the caste leader where he is representing the concern of Mahar, a spokesperson of the untouchables and also as a national statesman. So, you may find in contemporary discourse on Ambedkar uh, that all the parties and this I will come to um, uh, discuss in a minute, but there is a kind of segregation of Ambedkar merely as a caste leader or the spokesperson of the untouchables and very less and less on the um, uh, Ambedkar as a national leader or as a um, democratic uh, uh, thinker or a kind of um, um, all India or a nationalist um, um, uh, uh, person. So, many parties and groups may question Ambedkar and his politics during his time. But in contemporary times, certainly the re-emergence of Ambedkar gives us a different picture of uh, Ambedkar, which I will discuss. So, we can find in him three kind of roles as a caste leader, as a spokesperson of untouchables and also as a national leader. So, as the caste leader, Ambedkar was the guide and decision maker of the Mahar communities. In his second role, he was the spokesperson of the untouchables and negotiated with all the organizations and government for the protection or for safeguarding their interest. As a national leader or a statesman, he played a critical role in making or drafting of the constitution and therefore, Ambedkar is also regarded as the modern Manu or the lawgiver of modern India. So, he is also uh, regarded in that role as a national statesman or a national leader and not merely as a caste leader or a spokesperson of the untouchables. So, in playing all the three roles, Ambedkar has also found himself not satisfied with the many uh, developments that was taking place or unfolding in post-independent India. And he was very unhappy with the Hindu religion or he therefore, converted to Buddhism and uh, for a very long time since 1930s as we have discussed, he distanced himself uh, from um, uh, gradually develop a sense of um, um, loss of all hope in the reforming or reformation of Hindu society. And especially after the uh, debacle of Hindu court bill, he, um, uh, uh, he resigned from the law ministership and also gradually turned to Buddhism uh, or Buddha. So, um, he was uh, often warned by the circumstantial limitations and this limited the realization of many of his objectives such as Hindu court bill or creating a society or a culture which would be uh, based on the principle of uh, liberty, equality and fraternity. So, he uh, experienced and he uh, 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 was uh, in many ways unsatisfied with the uh, developments in the post independent politics in India, especially after the um, uh, Hindu uh, code will con uh, controversy. So, uh, however, he played a very significant role in not just drafting the constitution, but also showing a way forward to construct a unified or common culture for future India. So, to maintain such common or united India, he wrote that I do not want that our loyalty as Indians should be in the slightest way affected by any competitive loyalty, whether that loyalty arises out of our religion, out of our culture, out of our language. I want all people to be Indians first, Indian last and nothing else but Indian. So, that is the emphasis or significance of fraternity in his political philosophy, where he want. Uh, so, in Indian identity or Indian modern selfhood, you may have come across that there is this um, uh, kind of duality in terms of one being a Bengali, then uh, an Indian or a Bihari then an Indian or a Marathi then an Indian or uh, 
similarly on the basis of language or religion or maybe the caste. But in Ambedkar conception of modern Indian, one needs to consider oneself first and last as an Indian and uh, there is no slightest duality uh, in terms of uh, loyalty towards uh, India. So, that kind of uh, fellow feeling or creation of a society which uh, treats everyone equally without um, um, any division of loyalty towards different uh, caste, culture, language and religion is something which uh, Ambedkar believe will lead to a kind of ideal society or a ideal culture where a democracy will uh, penetrate or transform not just the political sphere, but also the social and economic sphere in the country and that will lead to the progress of the nation as well. In the words of one of the uh, political scientists Christoph Jefferlund, uh, he writes about America that certainly he obtained major concessions from the British by collaborating with them, including a new policy of positive discriminations in favor of the untouchables. And his politics made an impact during the constitutional debates when he uh, gained more concessions for the Dalits and succeeded in marginalizing some Gandhian propositions. But he did not get the separate electorate he wanted for the scheduled caste. He failed to have concrete social reforms adopted such as the Hindu code bill and he was not able to establish a party representing the interest of untouchables of the untouchables of India as a whole. So, there are many achievements uh, in Ambedkar or through Ambedkar politics, but there are certain limitations also uh, uh, in, in his uh, politics which we have discussed in our previous lecture as well. Uh, and uh, uh, so, this is a kind of comprehensive or kind of overall assessment of Ambedkar not just as a thinker, but also as a political activist and his achievements and limitations in Christoph Jefferlund. However, despite such limitation in fulfilling many of uh, his ideals in practice, Ambedkar established a legacy and that legacy is more important than what he has achieved and certainly in the revival of contemporary interest in Ambedkar and his thought signifies such legacy of Ambedkar. Never before the equalities was uh, that was practiced for generation, it was never before so radically condemned or criticized. He in fact made untouchability or caste exploitation a national priority and it has a uh, uh, global um, 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 repercussions also. So, uh, he used different platforms or organizations or mechanism to make uh, this issue of untouchability or the caste exploitation a national priority, a major uh, political issue in the political development in India. So, in criticizing these inequalities, he simultaneously presented an alternative vision of social organization which is democratic and based on the principle of liberty, equality and fraternity. This made Ambedkar one of the most inspiring and visionary thinkers of modern India and that is perhaps his greatest contribution. So, um, Ambedkar uh, in his lifetime was critical of not just Congress and the Gandhian politics, but he was equally critical of socialist and the communist modes of politics. He was also critical of uh, the uh, right wing Hindutva politics, um, uh, certainly as Hindu Mahasabha or their conception of Hindu Rashtra. He was very critical of such uh, revivalist, uh, revivalist politics, uh, uh, but nonetheless uh, his foresightedness or his vision uh, was so relevant uh, that uh, uh, when he is attacking many of the evil practices or the inequalities and that is remarkable. So, prior to that as I was saying that there is uh, many reforms movement, social reforms movement in modern India and also in pre-modern India such as Buddhism or uh, during the Bhakti and Sufi movement. But uh, for them the uh, struggle or fight was for religious equality or treating everyone equally in the eyes of uh, God or uh, fighting for the religious equality. But for the first time Ambedkar uh, uh, was aspiring for 
fighting for equality in the social, economic and the political sphere also. And there he had alternative vision for a egalitarian society or a culture which would be more democratic or um, uh, founded on the constitutional principle of uh, liberty, equality and fraternity and not uh, divided on the basis of caste or any kind of descriptive identity. And therefore, in modern times you find uh, the critique of Ambedkar's and to whom Ambedkar's criticize um, uh, very um, strongly are uh, competing with each other to adopt the legacy and thought of Ambedkar in today. And in many ways, the millions of Dalits who uh, consider him as an icon or as a uh, 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 liberator uh, is also uh, helpful in uh, uh, re-establishing Ambedkar as one of the um, uh, uh, most uh, influential thinker of uh, modern India. In contemporary politics, perhaps Ambedkar and his ideas are relevant more uh, uh, than he was uh, during his time or after few decades uh, few decades after the uh, independence. So, there is a kind of gradual emergence of Ambedkar as an all India thinker and not merely as a caste leader or as a spokesperson of untouchables and that is something which we need to engage more and more with Ambedkar and his thought. So, uh, on his thought uh, this lecture you can uh, refer to some of these texts like sources of Indian tradition and Ambedkar and the future of Indian democracy by Jean Dreze and also political thought in modern India by Pentham and Duch. Ramchandra Guha also some excerpts from Ambedkar and his speech will be very helpful to understand his vision of democracy and also constitutional morality which you should and must refer to. So, political philosophy of Dr. B. R. Ambedkar by A. M. Rajasekhar Raya and him uh, Lata Jairaj is also something you can look at and certainly this text by Pratap Bhanu Mehta will help you to understand um, um, his conception or also uh, Ambedkar's conception of constitutional morality and also the uh, uh, concept of constitutional morality in general. So, these books you can uh, refer to his views or uh, to understand his views on democracy and constitutional morality. So, thanks I hope you enjoyed the lecture, thanks for your patience.